Good morning, church. So this morning, Gwen and Mike are away. They are at a conference in California. They'll be back next Sunday. But we're um, honored to have Pastor Don this morning. So everyone, let's clap and welcome Pastor Don. And um, as far as announcements, the only one that I know of is that baptisms are coming up. If you're interested, reach out to Pastor Mike and let him know, and he'll talk to you about that and set you up. And does anyone else have any announcements I don't know about? No? Okay, that's it. All right, well, let's go to uh, the Lord in worship. Hello. If you, good morning. If you'd like, please stand. turned into wine open the eyes of the blind there's no one like you none like you into the darkness you shine out of the ashes we rise there's no one like you none like you our God is greater our God is stronger God you are higher than any other our God is healer awesome in power our God our God Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Our God is greater Our God is stronger God you are higher than any other Our God is healer Awesome in power, our God, our God. And if our God is for then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And what could stand against? in power, our God, our God, our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God, and if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us, and if our God is with us, and what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, and what could stand against? And what could stand against? Our God is great. God is stronger, God you are higher than any 
other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. Please have a seat. Hello again. Uh, that song's perfect for right before we pray. Um, just that God is greater and stronger and higher than any of our needs or wants or hopes. And so we go to him with that in mind. Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning and we thank you that we can gather together, Lord. We thank you for um, your protection and your peace, not only in this time, but in all times. Um, we pray for um, just protection uh, as people do start um, just opening things up and going about and doing their usual business. Thank you, God, for being able to go back to some usual business. Um, please go before those that have decided to travel. Just give them traveling mercies as they go and come. Um, please go before um, just all the businesses, Lord. Um, bless them and keep them, Lord, and help them. Um, to rebuild and flourish in this time. Um, we just thank you for just seeing us through the ups and the downs. Um, we thank you for all of your blessings. We thank you for um, our families, um, for both those that are still with us and those that have gone, that you have blessed us with uh, their presence in our life and uh, made us better for it. Um, God, uh, there's so much to pray for and thank you for. Um, but uh, we just lift up this service today. Uh, we lift up Pastor Don. Um, we pray that your um, Holy Spirit would use him and speak through him and that uh, we wouldn't just hear with our heads but also with our hearts and that we would leave changed. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'd like, please stand. Fill 
filled with wonder, awestruck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath, living water, such a marvelous mystery. to come with all creation I sing praise to the king of kings you are my everything and I will adore you holy 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 is the Lord God almighty who was and is and is to come with all I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Adore you. I've heard it said. That a man would climb a mountain Just to be with the one he loves How many times has he broken that promise It has never been done I've never climbed the highest mountain but I walk the hill of Calvary Just to be with you I would do anything No, oh, there's no price I would not pay No, just to be with you I would give everything oh, Yes, I would give my life away I've heard it said that a man would swim the oceans Just to be with the one he loves All of those dreams are an empty motion It can never be done And I've never swam the deepest ocean but I walked upon the raging sea Just to be with you I would do anything Oh, there's no price I would not pay No, just to be with you I would give everything Yes, I would give my life away yeah, yeah, and I know that you don't understand the fullness of my love, how I died upon the cross for your sins. And I know that you don't realize how much that I gave you, but I promise I will do it all again just to be with. I've done everything Oh, there's no price I did not pay No, just to be with you I gave everything Oh, yes, I gave my life away Yeah, yeah, yes, 
Welcome, Pastor Don. Thank you very much for coming. I want to welcome those who are online. Let me see. Oh no, won't work. <laughs> but if you're online, welcome, glad to have you, glad to have everybody here. It's been seven years since I stood behind this pulpit and uh, it's good to be back. Let's see if I can make it work. It's going to be an interesting kind of message today, a little different from what you may be used to, but I was not raised as a Christian. Neither my folks nor my sister knew Jesus or were even churched. I had some cousins who were church people, and I think my mother's parents occasionally attended some activities at a Finnish Lutheran church in northern Minnesota, but that was it. It was the closest I got to Christ. So I grew up as a mis mischievous, troublesome kid. Nothing horrible, no murders, rapes, or armed robberies, but uh, just some independent, undesirable behavior. I started smoking somewhere around age 12, and within a year or two after, I started drinking a little bit. Couldn't drink much because me and the guys I hang around with had to save some money to find somebody of age to go buy us a six pack of beer or a little bottle of booze. When I was in junior high, we spent a lot of hours at Packy's Pool Hall writing book reports on books we hadn't read. And in that day, uh, Hanging around the pool hall was a pretty shady environment, especially for kids our age, junior high age. Now later, uh, my folks and I moved to California and I attended five different high schools in my freshman year. Well, that led a lot of trying to fit in and acting out. In my sophomore year, we kind of settled in Orangevale, California, which is just outside Sacramento. And I went to San Juan High. They had a fairly large gravel covered parking lot that was L-shaped with a cafeteria here and classrooms here, lots of glass. Well, one night I was driving my folks car, an old Rocket 88, 1950, wow. And I had some friends with me, and for some reason, we ended up in that parking lot and ran into some more friends that we knew. After some chatter and laughter, I cut a couple of hookers. Anybody know what a hooker is? <laughs> Today, they call them a donut, I think. You crank the steering wheel as far to the right as you can, put the metal to the pedal, and it just spins around in a circle. Well, I did a couple of those, but I had to quit because I heard our friend Ed screaming over here. And uh, I had heard the rocks pinging off of the glass of all the windows. Fortunately, Ed was facing the other way. His legs were gone. I don't know if he had polio or what, but he walked on crutches all the time. His feet hardly ever touched the ground. So he had shoulders and arms that were, man, something else. So he'd do handstands and he'd do push-ups from a handstand. And he was doing one of those when I cut the hooker. Fortunately, he was facing the other way, so the only thing that got splattered with rocks was his back. 
and that hurt enough, so we had to quit the that kind of stuff. Somewhere around my senior year or so, I began to grow up a little more. I worked with my dad on drill rigs, exploration drill rigs during summer vacations. Then after graduation, I went to work for the state of California doing the same kind of stuff. We were away from home a lot, traveled all the way from Alturas to Lost Hills, which is west of Bakersfield. So, of course, as I was away from home and I was with drillers, I caroused a bit. And uh, I had a science teacher who had made a real impression on me, A.J. Crossfield, taught physics and chemistry, and so I wanted to go to the University of Minnesota and study chemical engineering, which meant that after graduation, for two years, I had to really toe the mark work and save money because at that time there were no readily available student loans that somebody else is going to pay off. And scholarships were pretty limited, especially for goof-offs. So I had to work and earn some money. Went to the university for one year. I'd lost all my study habits in that two years of working. And I really struggled with the differential calculus and inorganic chemistry while also taking other solid subjects. I was taking 18 and 19 credits per quarter at the University of Minnesota. I was on, uh, what do they call it? On uh, probation for a couple of those classes for a couple of quarters, but I made it through one year. I, then, uh, I also, during that time, had to, of course, keep up a good social life, which led me to propose to a girl I had dated just a couple of times. That was really capital D, capital U, capital M, capital B, dumb. And I knew it. But male ego and pride set in and we were married that September out in California. We came back out to California from Minnesota. We both worked at Aerojet General. Anybody know that? Missile manufacturer doing Titan and Minuteman missiles and some Polaris. Uh, and they paid very well because they were on government cost plus contracts. That means they would bid what they thought it would cost them to produce the missile plus a certain percentage profit. And the government cut them off of that contract because they were fudging expenses. Well, that's what gave us those great wages. And so we were able to do all kinds of fun stuff that we wouldn't have been able to do otherwise and enjoying having things that we would not have had, but we were able to then. Well. We had a baby and that brought more friction into an already less than solid marriage. When the government cracked down on Aerojet, they moved to a layoff program which took them from 25,000 employees to 5,000 employees in two years. I happened to be in an area of work and in a position where I could see that coming and I recognized that the first people they were laying off were the highest paid, and they were gonna get down to me pretty soon. So I went immediately looking for work, got to work with Burroughs Corporation in sales. During that period of time, both of my parents died, which was really tough. My mother was killed in a car accident. My dad died of a heart attack away from home. But uh, that took away the little family guidance that I did have. So at Burroughs, I was really looking to do well, and I did pretty good. So good, I was transferred to Reno, and I did better there and was promoted to sales manager. I worked with upper management in a number of companies in town, including Harold's Club, and that all built a desire for more desirable things in the good life and a lot more pride set in leading to a, 
um, divorce, a very painful divorce. Well, the office in which I worked was a small building on St. Lawrence, just a block off Virginia. Up in this corner, it had a dentist, and our office was here, and the office where Twyla and four other women worked was over here, and they had a manager whose name was Walt. He had a, one of our accounting machines, Burroughs accounting machines, and our serviceman took really good care of that, and he let us use his key punch machine and sorter machine for any uh, thing that we needed for. So we were there, and uh, after a while, I decided I needed to leave Reno. Well, Twyla and I and her two kids were together one day, and uh, I was telling her that I had talked to my district manager in San Francisco who wanted to send me to Alaska. He wanted me to be assistant branch manager so he could promote me to branch manager when he could take that guy out and put him somewhere else. Well, that was a little uncertain for me and the environment wasn't too good so I talked to the Los Angeles manager and he set it up for me to go to Hawaii. Yeah, what a difference, huh? Well, we were talking about it and uh, I, I realized that I was a little reluctant to leave because I'd kind of grown pretty fond of Twyla and her 10-year-old daughter Susan said, well, why don't you two just get married and we'll all go ho to Hawaii? <laughs> what? Whoa. Okay, well, we talked about that a little. And we thought about it and decided to just do that. Another bad mistake. <laughs> now, understand, like my first marriage decision, there's nothing wrong with the other parties. Both were fine women. We just didn't know each other very well. We hadn't taken too much time. And I was not ready for the commitments of marriage. We we're going against a whole lot of counsel, which I later as a pastor gave to a number of couples in premarital counseling. Didn't follow it at all. Well, you know, today <clears throat> our nation is experiencing a lot of problem and discussion about race. Well, that's nothing new in Hawaii. Our daughter Susan is fair-skinned and blonde. At school, she was called shark bait. Ooh, that's prejudice, right? Yeah. Our son Sam was a little darker and had dark brown or black hair and he was much more reserved. He wasn't as mouthy as our daughter was, so he had less trouble. But we were all, all four of us, haoles. You ever heard that term? In, in Hawaii, a haole is a white mainlander. At work, I had a totally kama'aina, or local, service department who I was dependent upon for setup and delivery of everything I sold. I sold great, I was well above quota, but they were all sitting back in the service department because the Kama'inas, the locals, took care of their own first. And I didn't get paid until the machine was delivered and the customer was using it. So that was a little tough. Twilight and I were also having some problems with ex-spouses over shipping kids back and forth for visitation. You know, from, from Reno, Nevada, and Sacramento to Hawaii, it was not an easy thing for 10, 11, 12-year-old kids. And we weren't achieving the goals or the dream that we had set to start with a small sailboat and build up so that we could sail the South Pacific. And we were doing a lot of things there to prepare. We went to, to the library to hear presentations and see movies and videos of people who had done that. And we were learning how to pack food, you know, for six months in a hot sailboat out in the ocean. But we weren't getting there financially. And there were a number of other things that stacked up. So we decided to return to the mainland to try to reach our goal from one of those beautiful little beach towns in Southern California. 
Well, we got there and found out those beach towns had all become part of the San Diego, Los Angeles megalopolis. The air was chewable, the traffic was horrible, and the ocean was a dirty brown, unlike Hawaii's shades of blue. So we headed north and ended up in the Sacramento area, which we were pretty familiar with. I worked for a couple of years at an electronic manufacturer as administrative manager, and then the corporate office decided to move all operations to Los Angeles. During that time, we discovered we had been misled in the house we had purchased. We were not in the school district we wanted to be in. The uh, San Juan Folsom School District was really good. We were in the Sacramento district, which meant in a couple of years, the kids would be bused to downtown Sacramento to a couple of pretty rough schools. So we immediately then decided that we were gonna have to move. So we listed our house, sold it, and moved to Citrus Heights. And at that time, I was still doing fine at Sparta Electronic. So we foolishly overbought. And that immediately started to lead to some financial difficulties when the corporate office of Sparta moved everything south and we didn't go, we stayed north and I had to start looking for new work. And that led to financial stress, difficulty. And in a couple of years, I received a wonderful revelation or insight or whatever you want to call it. I was thinking about our marriage, thinking about the problems we had. And I was wondering, what, what's going on here? What is this? And I, and I heard, almost an audible voice in my head say that my marriage was doing just like my first one did. Whoa. And I was definitely intent on not having another divorce. So I thought a little more about it and I de determined one other thing. There was only one thing common to both marriages and that was me. So I was gonna have to do some changing and see things differently. Well, unlike my first try at marriage, Twyla and I tried counseling. And we'd gone through a number of different ones. The last counselor we had was a county counselor who charged on a sliding scale so we could afford him, couldn't afford any others. But he was limited to seeing us only a certain number of times. I can't remember what it was, eight, 10. In our last visit, which was not long before I had that insight or that revelation, he said, have you folks ever gone to church? Which surprised me, coming from a county counselor, but we thought about it. And when we received that insight about our marriage and me being the only common thing, we decided to try church. We decided against the first two we visited. The first one, I just couldn't go back. The pastor was kind of short and a little chunky, and she was not to my liking. In those days, I had this idea of what a church was, and it didn't include a female pastor. Second one we went to, Twyla was working retail, and she was working that Sunday, so I took our son Sam and went to a free Methodist church, not too far from where we lived. We walked in, we're standing in the lobby, and Sam grabbed my hand and says, come on, we gotta get out of here, we gotta get out of here. So I thought, okay, we got outside, and I said, what's wrong? He said, I saw two girls from my class in school over there, I can't go here. <laughs> <coughs> so after really spiritual discernment over two churches, we tried another one that was just a block from our home. The people were really friendly, they were really nice. They didn't even have a pastor at the time because their other pastor had left and so the credit manager from Sears was the one who spoke that Sunday but he did a very good job and we stayed there and within a few weeks or so a new pastor came. We immediately made a counseling appointment with him and when we got there we talked with Pastor Schaefer for just a little bit generally and then he started asking us about the problems we were having and why we were there for counseling. And we'd tell him one thing and he'd say, good, let's hand that to Jesus in prayer. So we would. And after we'd gone through a, a number of things, he looked at me and he said, 
Is there any reason you shouldn't hand your whole life to Jesus in prayer? Whoa, I couldn't think of a thing right off the spur of the moment. So I said, no. So he prayed, and he knew Twyla had walked with Jesus earlier in, in her life. And so uh, he prayed with us then for me to accept Jesus and for her to recommit her life. As we left that evening, I was walking on air. I didn't know why. I didn't have a clue. But something had happened, and I was just walking on air. <coughs> now, my title for this message is A Story of Spiritual Formation. You might wonder how I came up with that with everything that I've been talking about. How does that fit? How does that come together? Well, I want to read to you something from a book Twyla and I have been using for devotions. It's called The Reservoir. And uh, Richard Foster founded an organization called Renovari, and they put this booklet out. And on month one, week one, Dallas Willard, you've heard Mike mention him. He's a, a pastor and a teacher and a uh, theologian. He wrote, spiritual formation is the process by which the human spirit or will is given a definite form or character. It happens to everyone. He goes on, uh, the, the writers of the book who join together say, the inner being, each one of us, our personality, character, and will is gradually shaped by everything and everyone we spend time with. Most of us are completely unaware of this formation process. When we do become aware of issues in the way we've been formed, a struggle with anger, pride, or insecurity, we often don't know how the problem developed or what we can do about it. The good news is that there is something we can do about it. The good news is that there is something we can do about who we are now and about who we are becoming. An awareness of our own spiritual formation will allow us to become more intentional about what and who we let shape us. <coughs> Everything I've shared has been a part of my spiritual formation. All my contacts and experiences have been part of the process by which my will was given a defined form or character. Your contacts and experiences have been part of your spiritual formation. We have all been shaped by everything and everybody we've spent time with. And have you heard the old quip, you can't fly with the eagle when you spend every night with the turkeys? Well, that's kind of the way my life was for 38 years until we went and talked with Pastor Schaefer. The kind of people I hung around with, the places I went, the things I did were the turkeys. I wasn't flying with the eagles. I did a lot of things, went a lot of places, enjoyed some nice stuff, had some good times, some fine accomplishments, but I was not who God created me to be and was not doing what he created me to do. That part of my spiritual formation did not really begin until I allowed Jesus Christ to come into my heart and be Lord of my life. The Apostle Paul wrote in uh, Philippians 4, 4 through 9, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, 
present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Now, along with the Apostle Paul, I have to say what he says in Philippians 3, 12 through 14. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward is what ahead, towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I thank God for Pastor Schaefer who taught us about Jesus Christ and the nature of salvation and the promises that God makes us and what God and Jesus can do in our lives. I found that process of growing, the spiritual formation process, often to be painfully slow. I'm the kind of guy who sees something and wants to do it. My wife is worse. She says, just do it. Let's get it done. So we both struggle with that transformation process. You don't say the sinner's prayer and bam, all your sins are gone and will bother you no more. It's a step-by-step -step lifelong process process of growth so we need to persist and allow Jesus to change to strengthen and lead us by his timetable into spiritual maturity amen I pray that you're on this spiritual journey that you'll allow Jesus to do that for you because it makes so much better a life Father God, we thank you for this privilege and this opportunity to be here together as the Church of Jesus Christ, of which you are the head. We pray that as we leave this place, you will go with us, carrying us along the way, showing us the way that we might become the people you created us to be, doing the things you want us to do. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here today. You are dismissed. <laughs>